one of the songs you sang, I open up my heart to you. In that same song, you sang this. You sang, more than anything that you can do, I just want you. Another song, you sang this. May we claim more than just your name. May we trust more. May we be yours. May we claim more than just your name. May we trust more. May we be yours. And and the question I want to ask you as we start tonight is this. Do you really believe what you just sang? In fact, let me just get straight to the issue. Do you love Jesus? Do you actually love Jesus? As you're singing those songs, are you moved to think about what you are singing, the words that you are singing, that you are singing, God, I don't want to just have your name. I don't just want to wear the name Christ. I want to be all yours. Forget labels. Forget what people are going to call me. Am I all in? Am I a follower of Jesus? Do I love Jesus? I want you to think about tonight, that tonight because if we back up here at the end of last week, and I made a little bit of a big deal about this because of what it meant about how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were living their lives to testify to the glory of God. You remember when they came out of the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar's response and reaction to them was what? What did he say? He said, blessed be who? Blessed be God, right? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we're thinking to ourselves, okay, well, maybe this evil despot, this King Nebuchadnezzar, who was one of the most ruthless and cruel rulers to ever walk the face of the planet, maybe he's coming around. Maybe he, maybe he loves God. After all, he's saying, look, This is the God, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God able to rescue in this way. Y'all, those are amazing statements that he just made there. And maybe you're tempted to think, okay, Nebuchadnezzar gets it. He's coming around. He's, He's following God now. But the problem is then we come to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 opens in another kind of strange way for us. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages. So Daniel 4 is, is no longer Daniel writing at this point in time. This is a letter from King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And he opens up, he says, look, I'm writing to everyone, everyone in the world that dwell in all the earth. He says this, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Again, we're thinking, well, maybe Nebuchadnezzar gets it. But see, the opening of chapter four is really after everything else that happens in chapter four. Nebuchadnezzar starts with this greeting and it would have shocked everybody who was within earshot of the reading of this letter. For a king that was as ruthless as Nebuchadnezzar was to start by saying, peace be multiplied to you. For a king that that amassed wealth and power for himself to refer to the most high God and that not be a reference to himself, man, this would not have made sense to the people that were hearing this letter and receiving this letter. But again, this is after everything else that happens in chapter four. And so we leave Nebuchadnezzar in chapter three thinking to ourselves, maybe he gets it. You know, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter three, at the end of chapter three, he's singing, man, may I claim more than just the name of God. May I be God's. May I trust him. May I be his. That's, that's in essence, what Nebuchadnezzar's doing at the end of, of chapter three. Just like some of you did tonight. But then we get into what happened in chapter four that led to this proclamation at the beginning. Look there at verse four of chapter four. Nebuchadnezzar says this. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house. I was prospering in my palace. So things were good, man. Things were easy for me. And I saw a dream that changed everything. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought in before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream. So this is different than chapter 2, because here he's saying, look, I'll tell you the dream. But still, they could not make known to me its interpretation. Have you guys ever had deja vu? It's a weird thing, isn't it? 
You're sitting there going, I feel like I've done this before. I've been here before. I've had this exact same thing happen to me before. I wonder if Nebuchadnezzar had that with this whole situation. Because it's almost a carbon copy of chapter two, except that this time he's told them the dream. So he calls them in. He says, look, here's the dream. Tell me what it means. And still, even after he tells them, they're not able to give him the interpretation. But I want you to notice what it says in verse four real quick. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I'm going to suggest to us that that's pretty much the description of all of us in this room right now. I'm not saying that your life is easy, but I'm saying compared to what it could be, this is where you're at. And so it's one thing for you to stand up and say, may I claim Jesus more than just your name? May I be yours? May I... I, may I trust you more? I want to be all yours, Jesus. I open up my heart to you. Nothing else matters except for Jesus. The question I want us to come back to tonight over and over and over again is, is that true? Do you actually believe that? Do you love Jesus? And what if you weren't at ease in your house and prospering in your palace? Would you still love Jesus? And maybe sometimes that's when it's easier to love Jesus. Man, when the heat gets turned up in my life, I feel like, man, I'm more dependent on God when I'm, I'm suffering. I'm more, I, I'm, I'm closer to God when I'm going through a trial because I'm reminded, man, I need God. Well, newsflash, you need God when you're at ease in your house and prospering in your palace. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand. See, chapter three, the fiery furnace is, is in the rearview mirror. It's in the past. And Nebuchadnezzar is now not thinking about, man, oh, God delivered them from the fiery furnace. That's so amazing. And nobody should speak a word against God because he's so phenomenal. And Nebuchadnezzar gets comfortable. And now all of a sudden, God's bumped out of his life. And for some of you in this room, that's your reality as well. This is the most God that you have during your week is this 45 minutes right now. And y'all, that's not enough. If this is all you give to the Lord, then he is not your Lord. So Nebuchadnezzar is comfortable, and God says, okay, Neb, I'm going to get your attention. So again, he gets this dream, and it says in verse 5, notice the contrast. From verse 4, I was at ease and prospering, and then verse 5, I had a dream that made me afraid, and the visions and fancies, whatever that is, in my head alarmed me. So he's having another bad dream, and this dream has shook him so bad that he calls in all of his wise men and everything else, and, and they can't interpret the dream. But this time, Nebuchadnezzar knows he's got an ace up his sleeve, right? Because he knows he's got Daniel. Look at verse 8. At last, notice the relief there. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't get it, does he? And I told him the dream saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. That relief that washes over the king because he sees that there's something unique about Daniel. He understands, okay, there's something different about this guy. He's not quite there. I mean, he's saying he's got the spirit of the holy gods, plural, and every time I read that, I want to just say, no, it's not gods, plural, lowercase g, it's God singular, uppercase g. But verse 10, he tells Daniel the dream. He says, the visions of my head as I lay in my bed were these. I saw and behold, there was a, a tree in the middle of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth and its leaves were beautiful and its fruit was abundant and in it was food for everyone. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. This tree, y'all, was phenomenal. It was amazing. If you've ever been up to the Sequoia Forest and you've stood at the base of those gigantic trees and just taken in their majesty, their grandeur, their massive size, you're getting a little bit of a glimpse of the idea here, that this thing is just so massively huge, but it's, it's taken to an infinite degree because it's visible throughout the entirety of the earth. No matter where you are in this dream, this tree is visible. And the, sh the, the shade that it provides, all the animals come and take refuge under it. And its branches provide a home for the birds. And it, it's nourishing and it's caring for everyone. And it's just the, the source of all this nutrition and protection and life for people. But then in verse 13, he says, I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold, a watcher, a holy one came down 
from heaven. And he proclaimed aloud and said this, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. So suddenly from this vision of this tree, which so far that's a good dream, this massive tree, right? Now there's an, an, uh, an angelic creature. It says a, a watcher, a holy one, right? Comes down from heaven and orders the beautiful tree all but destroyed. The tree is chopped down. The branches are stripped off. The leaves are stripped off the branches. And then with all the food and the shelter gone, the animals flee from the tree. The tree is left abandoned. The tree is left isolated. The tree is left with no one to turn to at all. Except there at the end, it says that what's left is the stump. And the stump has this band of iron and bronze wrapped around it, which gives the understanding and the idea that maybe that tree could grow again. So this is Neb's dream. And this is the thing that leaves him shook, that, that causes him to wake up and say, okay, I'm not at ease and prospering in my palace anymore. Because remember, well, like we talked about in chapter two, the Babylonians thought the dreams were messages from who? The gods, right? Well, we would say not messages from the gods. We would say messages from God. So God is using a medium that Nebuchadnezzar understands, which is dreams, to communicate something to him. And he's, he's confronting Nebuchadnezzar in his ease and in his prosperity. And he's reminding Nebuchadnezzar, basically what he's doing to Nebuchadnezzar is he's calling him on the carpet saying, look, I'm either Lord of your life in the entirety and at all times, or I'm not Lord of your life at all. And that's what some of us need to understand and recognize as well. Is God's not satisfied with you just coming to him when you need him and then neglecting him when you're comfortable. If that's your relationship with God, you don't have a relationship with God. You have a relationship with an idea of God. See, God wants you at all times, in every place, in every circumstance, in everywhere. And he wants you always mindful that you need him. And that's why I ask you, do you love Jesus? Right now, tonight, do you love Jesus? Or do you just love him when you need him? Which even that statement, right? When do you not need Jesus? Colossians 1, what does Paul say there? He says, in Jesus, in Christ, all things hold together. So what's keeping your, your heart beating, your lungs pumping right now? It's not biology. Sorry to step on your toes, all you pre-med majors out there. You're like, oh, well, see, the church hates science. No, it's, it's, it's biology because Jesus makes biology work. Because Jesus is holding everything together. That's why your body works the way it does. When do you not need Jesus? The answer to that question is never. So... The, the thing that we have to get is we need to stop living like we don't need Jesus because we're comfortable and we grow complacent and we forget that we need him. Pick up in 15 again. It, it's again the statement, believe that stump. And then notice the, the pronoun changes from it to him in verse 15. Let him, who? The stump. So now we're understanding that this represents a, a person, Right? Let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So this weird phenomenon is described here where this one represented by the tree in the dream is going to all of a sudden have his mind transformed and be given the mind of an animal instead of the mind of a human being and he's going to be driven from humanity and he's going to be caused to, to act like an animal like a wild animal it says until seven periods of time which is a reference to seven years pass and then he comes to realize the power and sovereignty of God he comes to realize his need for God right did y'all know that there's, there's actually a disease in the medical field that's known as lycanthropy? That is what's being described right here. In fact, in 1946, a, a patient in a British mental institution exhibited the exact same behavior that we find in, in Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter four. 
And so this is not beyond the, the scope of, of possibility. Plus, once we allow for the existence of God, right, we can allow for him to do what he wants to do, yes? But this is something called lycanthropy. It still happens right now. People have been known to act like wolves and gerb, gerb, gerbils. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Dogs, birds, cats. I mean, it's, it, they, they just take on this persona of an animal. And that's really what happens in Nebuchadnezzar's mind. But it's not because of a, a physiological misfire. It's because God was doing something. It's because Nebuchadnezzar, even though at the end of chapter 3, he's wanting to praise God. And in chapter 4, he's comfortable and he's forgotten God. And God is now saying, hey, Neb, remember me? Remember me, the most high God? And that becomes the theme of this chapter. Verse 17, when he says, until you recognize that he's the most high God and rules over the earth and gives it to whom he will and sets the lowliest, notice the, the language there, the lowliest on the throne. That same concept appears in verse 25, also in verse 32. Again, Nebuchadnezzar was at peace, prospering. He was loving life, enjoying his wealth, power, and prestige. And this dream had just undone all of that. And so he calls in Daniel. He tells Daniel the dream. And then we read in verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a little while. And his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. So Daniel's shook by the dream now. Not just Nebuchadnezzar, but now Daniel also. Because Daniel understands what this dream is all about and he understands that he's about to have to tell Nebuchadnezzar what's coming and that it's not going to go well for Nebuchadnezzar. And so he picks up in verse 20. It says, this, this tree that you saw, king, which grew and became strong so that it reached to the top of heaven and was visible to the end of the whole earth. This tree whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for everyone under which beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heaven lived. It's you, O king, who have grown and become strong and your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. And let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It's a decree of the most high which has come upon my Lord the king that you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time shall pass over you until... Until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots in the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. There's a lot of times in the Bible where you think to yourself, man, I would have loved to be there to see the reaction, to see that interaction take place, right? With David and Nathan. When Nathan comes in before David, he's like, King David, I've got this story about this rich man who had all these sheep, and then there was a poor man who had one tiny little sheep, and this traveler came to visit the rich man, and the rich man, rather than taking from his flock, went to the poor man and grabbed his only sheep that was a family pet and killed it and fed this traveler, and David's like, that guy deserves to die, and Nathan goes, you're that guy, right? And you could just hear a pin drop in the palace courts, but to, to, to be there, right? Same thing here, because Daniel's saying to King Nebuchadnezzar, not you're the man, but you're the, the tree. This is about you, king, which Nebuchadnezzar probably was guessing at this point in time. But Daniel's saying, yeah, you're the great and mighty king of Babylon now, but understand that if you don't understand God, if you don't recognize God, if you don't snap out of this self-dependence and self-glorification and self-sufficiency, if you won't realize who God is, king, you're gonna be driven from your kingdom and made to eat grass like a wild animal. He will humble you, king, if you won't humble yourself. Yeah, you eat from the finest food in the kingdom that it has to offer, but you're gonna be eating the grass with the cows in the field. You lay your head on the softest of pillows, but you're going to find moss and roots to be your pillows before too long, king. You clothe yourself with the finest materials known to man, but you're going to be wrapped in the morning dew before too long, king. Until you realize that God is the ruler of all and gives authority to whomever he wishes to give authority. 
And then Daniel says this before leaving the king's presence. He issues this plea in verse 27. He says, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins. What an awesome statement that is, right? Break off your sins by practicing righteousness. In other words, what? Repent. And your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed in order that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. In other words, Daniel's saying, it's not too late, king. If you will get right before God, truly, if you will truly get right before God, because you're not now, but if you will truly get right before God, king, there's still hope for you. Daniel knew Nebuchadnezzar was a proud man who refused to acknowledge God as the source of all of his riches, all of his power. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar was a comfortable man who refused to thank God for all of the, the comfort and ease that he was enjoying. And because God will always get the glory that he's due, Daniel also understood that Neb was headed for rough times if he wasn't going to heed his advice and repent from his sinful ways. Y'all, just like he did here with Nebuchadnezzar, God warns you and me as well. Not through dreams and visions, but through the pages of his word. He reminds us time and time again of, of his power and his might and his sovereignty and providing for everything that we need, right? And when you need him, when your life is difficult, right? When it, you don't know how you're going to make finances measure up this month. Or you need a job and you don't have a job. Or school's going bad and you need to... to get your grades up, or things are bad with your, your mom and dad, or things are bad with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, when you feel that, that uncomfortable, uncomfortability there, that word, yeah, when the burr's in your saddle and you feel it and you're going, man, I don't like this, then you draw near to God because then you're like, okay, God, I need you. But what about, what about where you're at tonight? Do you understand that you need God just as much tonight as you do during the times that you're Desperate form? You're just as desperate form tonight? If your life is fine tonight? I don't know if you've ever been repelling, but that rope, right, that you, you wear the harness, you've got the carabiners and everything else, but the, the, the key piece of equipment, right, is the rope. You're not repelling over anything without a rope. Do you guys understand that you need that rope as much when you're 100 feet up as you need it when you're 30 feet up? Just because you're closer to the end doesn't mean you need the rope any less. You may be a little bit more comfortable, more confident at that point in the rappel, but man, you still got to realize, man, I need that rope. Guys, you need Jesus all the time. All the time. Don't fall prey to Nebuchadnezzar just because life gets easy. Don't let your foot off the, the gas in pursuing Jesus and think, well, I'm okay. I don't need him. One of the best ways that you can make sure that you are daily desperate for Christ is to daily realize how good God is in your life. That's our first point tonight. Daily recognize God's goodness in your life. Daily recognize his goodness in your life. Y'all, there should never be a day in our lives where we can't find something to praise God for. Never. I don't care what you're going through. There should always be a time for you to be able to say, God, thank you for this. I want to worship you for this. I want to give you thanks and glory for this. I want to remember you right now. How often are y'all doing that? What's going good about your life right now? Think about it right now in your mind. The things that you are saying, man, this is going well for me right now. Have you thanked God for that? Do you understand that he is responsible for that? It's not you. If you're in a good relationship, it's not because of your physical appearance. It's not because of your smarts. It's not because you're witty. It's not because of any of that. It's not because your, your sense of humor. If you're in a good, strong, godly relationship, it's because of God, right? Because he's good to you in that. If you've got a good relationship with your mom and dad, it's not because you're a good kid. You're not, right? Right? There's no one who does good, not one. That's Paul, yes? You're a depraved wretch. Like, let's just be honest with ourselves. If you have a good relationship with your mom and dad, it's not because they're good parents. They're not. They're depraved wretches as well. It's because of God. It's because he's good. It's because he's kind to you. If you've got a good job and things are going well at your work, it's not because of you have your strong work ethic. It's just not. There's plenty of people with a strong work ethic out there. You could get swapped out for one of them easily. 
It's not because you're overly qualified for what you do. It's not because you're just the, 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 the thing that's making this company run the way it needs to run. Why do you have a good job? Because God has been good to you and kind to you. Y'all, if you are at ease and prospering in your palace, so to speak, it's because God has made you and created you and put you in a position in a season of life where you are at ease and prospering in your palace. But don't forget him. Don't forget him. Because all that he has done for you is to cause you to what? Worship him. To glorify him. To exalt him. To praise him. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar was not doing. He was worshiping himself, not God. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, Moses is addressing Israel and he's getting them ready to enter into the promised land. And he realizes, look, I'm not going. I hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock and now I'm not going into the promised land. So he's trying to get them ready and he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, look, take care. In fact, here it is on the screen if you want to follow along. Take care, be careful, lest you forget the Lord your God. By not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and you're full and you've built good houses and you live in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. The God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with his fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God, and if you go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So Moses is saying this, Once you get into the promised land and life gets easy, don't forget God. Right? How are you doing in this area? Y'all, how much time in your day is given to the Lord? Honestly, how much time are you given to the Lord? Are you doing the daily Bible reading each day? And a different question, and this is a question that you're going to talk about in your small groups. What are you doing with the DBR each day? Because I'm tired of us just asking the question, hey, did you do your DBR today? That's not good enough. Well, Pastor PJ, you're getting legalistic. No, I'm not. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him? Think about your, your, your dating relationship. For some of you, you may have to remember a long time ago for the last one, right? For some of you, it's a little bit easier, but whatever. Think about your communication with that person, right? You say, man, I love this person. They're just amazing. I'm going to marry them. Okay, probably not, but maybe. Um, But are you satisfied with one text to them during the day? In the morning, you wake up. Hey, just wanted to check in with you. Could you just tell me something that you're thinking this morning real quick so I can get about the rest of my day? You know where that relationship is going, don't you? And yet you treat Jesus that way. And you think you're fine because you've checked the box on the DBR. And you're like, well, good Christians read the DBR every single day. Yeah, but what are you doing with it? Do you understand that this is God's communication to you? And if you're going to sit here tonight and say, I love Jesus, and you're going to relegate your time with him to, here's a text from Jesus in the morning. Thanks, Jesus. Checked in. Are we good for the rest of the day? Can I go hang out with other people now that I care about more than I care about you? Except for when, oh man, Jesus, okay, I need you now because I just lost my job and I really don't know what I'm going to do. Jesus, I need you now because my relationship with my boyfriend just ended and now my life is just over because he was an idol in my heart that I worshiped instead of worshiping you. Uh, Jesus, I need you now because things are rough with my parents. Jesus, I need you. When you need him, then you want him on blast, don't you? But when you don't, it's like, Jesus, we'll catch each other on Sunday. I'm going to have to listen to a 45-minute sermon on Sunday. We're good, we're good. I got your text. I'll hit you up if I need you. I 
Exodus chapter 1. Nope, Exodus chapter 20. 1 plus 19, 20. Ten Commandments, right? Begins this way. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or on earth beneath or that is under the water or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Listen to that. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Jealous for what? He's jealous for you, guys. He wants you. He wants all of you. How much does he really want me? He killed his son for you. Poured out his wrath on his son for you. Sacrificed more for you than you've sacrificed for anyone ever. And he says, I just want you to love me. I want you to pursue me. I want to be in a relationship with you. And we're like, sweet, I'll hit you up when I need you. It's not good enough. Do you love Jesus? Do you actually love Jesus? Or are you just playing this game called Christianity because you were born in the church and that's all you've ever known how to do? If you can't answer, man, if, if I was born into a Muslim country and raised in, in Islam, would I be able to understand why Christianity is better? If you can't answer that question, then, then you are a cultural Christian. You are not a, a, a real genuine Christian who loves Jesus. Yo, we need to be careful to daily remember the good things that God has done in our lives. It's going to keep us mindful of how much we need him because we need him daily. And the only remedy for us is the remedy for Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what Daniel pled with him is that repentance. Look, break off your sin. Bow the knee to the Lord. Hey, and maybe, maybe he'll extend grace to you and you'll enjoy a little bit more prosperity if you remember God, Nebuchadnezzar. But it wasn't to be. Look at verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, at the end of a year, man, there's, there's time again, right? Man, time is such an enemy sometimes of our devotion to the Lord. Because you forget how much you need him. So 12 months passes. The king, this dream is in the back of his mind if it's even there anymore at all. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon and the king answered and said, is this not great Babylon, which I myself have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. You shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. Neb doesn't repent, does he? In fact, it's, it's the opposite. Just like for us, right? The initial fear, the initial terror, the initial conviction weighs and, and, and wanes and, and disappears from our lives. And we think to ourselves, okay, well, Maybe God's forgotten about that. And that, uh, that desperation that you felt for him when you really needed him, now all of a sudden, as life gets easier and easier and easier and goes better and better and better for you, you're thinking to yourself, well, do I really, do I really need him? Things are going pretty good for me right now. I love the description that while the words were still in the king's mouth, as he's saying, my glory, my majesty, boom, there's the angelic watchers. Calling him to account. You know, back in chapter 4, verse 2, Nebuchadnezzar refers to God as the most high God. It's a unique name for God. It's a name that appears in the book of Psalms 
on the, the mouth of the psalmist, but other times it's reserved for people that don't know the Lord. And it's, a, it's a, a testimony of his greatness and his power and his sovereignty as they come to understand that he truly is, okay, man, this guy's legit, that he's for real, that he is the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And Nebuchadnezzar's problem was that he had lost sight of the reality that he is the most high God, even though God had tried to reveal that to him back in chapter two. In fact, even chapter one, right? If Nebuchadnezzar's paying attention in chapter one to the fact that these guys are getting fat on celery, Right? he's going to understand, man, this is a, a God that I need to pay attention to. And then in chapter two, right? If Nebuchadnezzar paying attention there and then all of a sudden Daniel's able to give him the content of his dream, let's just stop right there. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, that came from the God I serve. Okay, I need to, to serve this God as well. But then he gives him the interpretation of that as well. Okay, yeah, I need to worship this God. Then you've got chapter three, right? And Nebuchadnezzar's sitting there with Rakshak and Benny and, and he's looking at them saying, you guys need to fall down and worship the, the giant statue when you hear the music, otherwise the furnace. Did you not hear me earlier? And they're sitting there thinking to themselves, we're not doing this. They interrupt the king. They say, we're not going to do this. He gets angry and throws a hissy fit. And he's like, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. So he does. And then he looks into the furnace, spits out his lemonade from his lawn chair and says, wait a minute, there's four people and they're not three and they're all walking around. And he goes up and he calls into the furnace and he says, hey, get out. And they come out and they're not even singed, right? God has been trying to get a hold of Nebuchadnezzar for three chapters so far in the book of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar is forgetting him, right? He's just like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. He's a God. He's a God that's out there. And, and God's saying, no, I'm not, I'm not a God. I'm the God. And you'll get that eventually. And that's what he's showing him here. See, Nebuchadnezzar forgot that he's the most high God. He hadn't understood that. He hadn't wrapped his mind around that, right? And instead, what had Nebuchadnezzar done? He had made himself God. Yeah, there was Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, and there was all these other gods. But really, at the end of the day, God for Nebuchadnezzar was himself because he had forgotten that he needed to be dependent upon God and depended instead on himself. Y'all, we can fall into that same trap. When we forget God, and how much we are desperate for him, and how much we need him, we end up relying instead on ourselves and we end up falling into the trap of prideful self-sufficiency instead of complete and utter dependency upon the Lord. Second point tonight is this. Avoid the pride of self-sufficiency. Avoid the pride of self-sufficiency. My son Luke, who some of you guys know, he's uh, five, learning to tie his shoes now because why not? In parenting, you just go from one hard thing to the next hard thing to the next hard thing, right? Like the first thing you're trying to do is get them to not pee in their pants, but in the toilet. And then you're trying to get them to poop in the toilet. And then you're trying to get them to be able to do everything that's involved with that by themselves and remember to flush and wash their hands. And then you're trying to get them to tie their shoes, right? And you think, well, this seems like a basic skill. Yeah, well, remember back to when you were learning how to tie your shoes, how difficult it was. So we're trying to teach them how to tie his shoes. And my mom came in town recently and she was showing him this video on how to do it because he's five and sure he can wrap his mind around a YouTube video explaining how to tie shoes. But he thinks he gets it. And so he's, he's going about his, his putting on a shoes routine and I'm asking him, Luke, do you need help? No, dad, I got it. I'm, I'm good to go. And about five minutes later, he brings me his shoe the other day and it's got probably 30 or 40 knots in it. He's like, dad, I did this and I don't know, what, I don't know how to not do it. Can you... <laughs> Can you undo everything that I did? So that was my next 15 minutes. But the point is this. I'm standing there, and I'm available, and I'm totally able to tie shoes. Like I'm, I've been doing it for a while, like probably a good 30 years or so, at least, right? I don't remember how old I was, but I'm, I'm going to give myself at least six or seven years old. So I'm there, and I'm able to do it, and Luke's sitting there going, yeah, I know Dad could do it, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it myself. Why? Because he wants to be independent. He wants to be self-sufficient. He wants to hold me at arm's length and say, Dad, I don't really need you in this anymore. Well, y'all, that's so often what we do with God. We forget that we need him, and then we turn and we say, we can handle it on our own. And the insidiousness of that is not so much that we make a mess of our lives, but what we do is, in doing that, we fall and pray to a view of ourselves that's way too lofty. Way too lofty, Right? See, the problem that humanity has at its core is a worship problem. This is the point that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans chapter 1. He writes this, For although they knew God, 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever, amen. See y'all, that's the core problem of humanity right there. It's not lust, right? It's not murder. It's not hatred. It's not greed. It's not covetousness. It's not anger. It's not wrath. It's not malice. All of those things are born out of a worship of the self. All of that is born out of a worship of the creature rather than the creator. That's the main, this is the courtroom. Here's the charges being read against humanity by God. And the primary foundational fundamental indictment against all of us is that we have a worship crime. That we rob God of the worship that he is due and instead we rob it for ourselves. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar was doing, y'all. And that's what we do too. You may have heard of sin as cosmic treason. That's what it is. It's pulling God off the throne, metaphorically speaking, as if we could do that. We can't, by the way. He's still God, even when we want to worship ourselves. And we're trying to put ourselves there instead. Thinking that we're the ones that are to be congratulated for all the good in our lives. Y'all, take your resume right now for a second. The things that you've accomplished, the things that you've done, all the things that you're tempted to be prideful about. Think of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter three. Paul does that, right? He goes through his resume in Philippians chapter three. And we read that, we want to run to, yeah, but it's all dung, it's all dung, and we know, and man, to live is Christ and die is gain, and it's all stuff. Guys, when Paul's reading that list of things in Philippians three, it's impressive. When Paul's saying, this is who I was, right? It's impressive. Like he's got a legitimate re- reason to boast when you look at Philippians chapter three. He was the man when it comes to Judaism. He was on a fast track to become super successful in a, an uber elite Pharisee and he was gonna be ruling the roost. He was a smart dude, impressive guy and he lists it all and he says, but in the end, you know what it is? It's garbage in light of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Are you willing to do that with your resume? Are you willing to take everything that you've worked for, everything that you boast in, everything that you think makes you special, are you willing to take that and throw it in the garbage can and say, it's worthless because I want Christ instead? Do you love Jesus? It doesn't mean that you don't pursue those things, but stop trying to impress people by what school you go to or what your plans are or what you want to do, or what your GPA is, or who you're dating, or what your plans are, or what your five-year goal is. Stop. Just stop trying to impress people. Impress people with your Savior, not with your resume. How can we avoid this this pride of self-sufficiency? Let me suggest one thing to you. Well, not one thing. That's a lie. Let me suggest a few things to you. Number one, begin every single day with prayer, and start that prayer with thanksgiving. Man, that is something that, that I've, I've gotten into the habit of doing and I can't remember the first person that suggested it to me, but I'm so glad that they did because it's so helpful for us to remember that, man, we need God for everything. Just seriously, begin your prayer time by thanking God. Thank him for the simplest things that you can think of. As you're sitting down tying your shoe, God, thank you for the motor skills to be able to tie my shoe. God, thank you for your shoes. God, thank you for my closet. Thank you for the clothes in my closet. Thank you for the house that I live in. Thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the car that I have as I'm driving to work. Thank you for the music that I get to listen to. Thank you that I can appreciate music. Thank you for this song. I, I, thank you for this food, right? I mean, guys, if, if, if we're serious about this task, you can spend hours just thanking God. And it's such a good thing to do. And it's gonna keep you dependent upon him and aware of how much you need him. Uh, second thing, let me suggest is this. Be quick to repent when you realize that and, and identify that self-sufficiency in your life. When you find those areas of pridefulness in your life, be quick to repent. Say, so God, I, I've been taking credit for 
something that you are worthy of the credit for, not me. I've been seeking glory in an area that you need to be glorified, not me. Third thing that we suggest for you to do is, is find the things that stir your affections for Jesus, that make you love Jesus more and fill your life with those. The things that are gonna make you think about Jesus, put more of that in your life. The things that you distract you from Jesus, get less of that in your life. And then finally, worship every single day, somehow, some way. If that means that you are, you know, Hillsong 3.0 in your car at the stoplight, belting out the songs at the top of your list, your lungs, maybe Hillsong with some more sound theology um, in some areas. But still, if, if you are just praising God at the top of your lungs in the car at the stoplight, awesome, do it with abandon. Or if worship for you is just spending time in the word of God, or if worship to you is enjoying a good cup of coffee and saying, man, God, thank you for this. This is amazing. I just want to give you thanks and, and praise and glory that you created this for us to enjoy. W worship him some way, somehow, every day. And avoid the pride of self-sufficiency because guys, we need him. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar saying, man, is this not great Babylon which I myself have built by my mighty hand? You guys haven't built a city, but whatever you feel like you have built, is this not my great five-year goal that I have planned by my mighty hand? Is this not my great dating relationship that I have built by my mighty hand? Is this not my great? Because here's the deal, guys. God will get glory. He will get the glory that he's due. And if you truly are a follower of Jesus and you've got something in your life robbing him of that glory, you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna yank that away from you. And it's gonna hurt. It's much better that you come to him and say, God, you can have this than for him to rip it from your hands. He'll win. He always does. He won with Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised, and I honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. With this effusive praise from the king, right? All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, this is what God was trying to communicate. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Guys, this is written by a pagan king, right? This sounds like Davidic praise, but this is not. It's Nebuchadnezzarian praise, right? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, my splendor returned to me out of God's grace to him, right? My counselors, my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right. All his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. We read something like that and I think the question comes to us, okay, so was Nebuchadnezzar saved, right? And commentaries have wasted pages upon pages on this question. I don't know, maybe, I, there's, there's, you can make an argument, right? I mean, he's praising God. He's worshiping God. It's truth. I mean, this is sound doctrine that we're reading here from the lips of Nebuchadnezzar about God's sovereignty, about his goodness, about his control, and who can stay his hand. And then you can also look at God's response, that God restores him and then adds to his kingdom, adds to his power. I, I mean, you might think there, okay, maybe this is genuine. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out someday. When we're in heaven, we'll be like, hey, is Neb here? Dude, we studied about you. I was wondering if you were here. I'm so glad to see you're here. That's awesome. So tell me about this, about this wild animal thing. What was that like, right? If not, you're going to be like, okay. Man, bummer. Well, you're not going to say bummer because you're going to be in heaven. There are no bummers in heaven. You can tweet that. But just as quickly as his reason abandoned him, it comes back. Why? Because he understood God, right? He realized, man, I need God. And I need God to be God of my life when it's the hard times and God of my life when it's the good times. I can never forget my dependence on God. And that's the point. Verse 17, verse 25, verse 32. Look, that's what God was after with Nebuchadnezzar. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision from the holy ones, until you, the living may know that the most high rules of the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Verse 25, until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Verse 32, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. See, 
just as, as Nebuchadnezzar needed that lesson repeated over and over and over again, guys, we need that as well. And, and maybe some of you are out there tonight thinking about this and your, your mindset has been this so far. Man, this seems pretty pedantic, pretty simplistic, pretty rudimentary for us, right? I feel like I've heard this message before. Pastor PJ, don't you have anything else for me? My answer is no. You, you need the reminder and I need the reminder. And, and it leads me to our final point and that's this. Recognize the significance of a sovereign God. That, that's what we're talking about in this whole chapter. Rec- in fact, the whole book. Recognize the significance of a sovereign God. And, and again, I get some of you are out there and you have the, the Timothy Award and you're thinking to yourself, man, come on, this is, this is beneath me. I get it. Yeah, I understand. God is sovereign. But guys, this is so much more than, than just simply a, a doctrine. Let me ask you, what difference did God's sovereignty make for you today before tonight? How much were you aware of the fact that God is sovereign over your life today? This is the God we serve. Isaiah 40, 25 through 28. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host, the stars that is, by number calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, because he is strong in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth, the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Y'all, that is the sovereign God that you serve. Today, it's, this is the God that you love, the God that you serve. Psalm 139, right? I think I've hit on this a couple times recently. But the, David says, oh Lord, you've searched me, you've known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path, my lying down, and are, are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Man, let's just stop there for a second. Do you understand what that means for your speech, that God is sovereign over your words, right? That he knows the words that you're going to speak before a word even leaves your mouth. And you think, man, just because I'm not around church people, I can talk however I want to talk. No, you can't. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. In other words, you can't outrun God's sovereignty. You can't get away from God's sovereignty. It's everywhere. It's all the time. It's, it's every place. It's every thought. It's every square inch of your life. He is sovereign over it all. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. The darkness is as light to you. You can't hide from God's sovereignty. You can't outrun God's sovereignty. You can't escape God's sovereignty. Shorter, Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You've got plans, y'all, but your plans are only going to unfold the way that God wants them to unfold. He is going to establish your steps. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart, the heart of leaders, it's a stream in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whichever way he wills. Guys, do you understand that, that God is sovereign? This is one of the core themes of the book of Daniel for us to understand that he's sovereign. The question I have for you tonight is, is the reality of God's sovereignty more than just a doctrine to you? Here's one sobering thought. There are a ton of well-read, well-churched theologians in hell. There are a ton of people who had sound doctrine during their lives who are in hell because all it was was doctrine. Does God's sovereignty impact your worship of him? Does it cause you to worship him to know that he is sovereign over your life and over every single aspect of your life? 
It caused Nebuchadnezzar to worship him. I mean, that's his response here at the end. He's praising and worshiping God when he understands who God is. Does it change the way that you make decisions? The fact that God is sovereign over those decisions. Or is he going to have to do something drastic to get your attention the way he did with Nebuchadnezzar? Again, yo, when you're repelling, you need the rope at 30 feet as much as you did when you needed it at 100 feet. You need God every single day of your life. Just as much as the day before. Just as much as tomorrow. And, and I return to the question, do you love Jesus? I'm going to give them more than just warning while I'm praying, but I'm going to ask if our worship team will come back up um, and sing... Uh, only you, one more time, as we close. And guys, I don't know what's going on in your hearts, okay? I don't. It's so funny when people come up to me, they're like, dude, you were preaching to me tonight. I saw you look at me. No, the Holy Spirit's convicting you, <laughs> all right? I, I don't write sermons for people. Um, I really don't. So if you feel pressed in on, then blame Jesus, not me. Um, take it up with the Lord in his word. But as we were singing before this, as we were singing this song, standing in the back, just kind of looking around the room, again, I, I, I can't judge hearts. And I understand we're not a church that raises hands because then obviously you go to hell as soon as you do that. So I'm joking, clearly, right? If you're out there going, Really? He believes that? No, I don't believe that. In fact, if you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. Don't be a distraction to people, but if you, I want you to worship. That's what I care about more than anything else out here, guys, is that you are worshiping the Lord, okay? And I know sometimes it's hard because you roll in here and we've got good food and then you're just hanging out with people and you're talking with people and then we've got the best announcements that have ever been ever in the history of any ministry ever. Um, and then the worship team's up here. And I, I know it's hard to make that adjustment and make that transition. But again, I, we're singing the song and I'm looking out there and we're singing those, the, that one line. May we claim more than just your name. May we be yours. We're about to sing that again, but here's the deal. Be intentional as we conclude with this song. If you're not there, don't, don't sing it. But if you are, think about, okay, what am I singing? What does this mean? I love Jesus and I love you with all of my life. And I don't just want the label Christian. I don't just want the sound doctrine. What did Paul say at the end of his life to Timothy? He said, look, I'm not ashamed. Timothy, I'm not ashamed. And he didn't say this. He said, he didn't say, I, I'm not ashamed because I know what I have believed. What did Paul say there? He said, I'm not ashamed because I know what? Who I have believed. Guys, it's, it's the object of our faith is what delivers us. It's the object of your faith is what matters. It's Jesus that matters, guys. And you need him now, whether your life is great or your life is in the pits right now. You need Jesus. Let's pray. God, we do need Christ so much, Lord. And we don't want to be those that trust in a label. God, we don't want to be those that hang our hat on having been at a, a certain church for a certain number of years or gone through this program or that program. God, we don't want to be those that hang our hat on sound doctrine. If the doctrine doesn't transform our lives, God, we want to be those that truly can say, we want to be yours. And love you with everything that we have, not just when it's easy, not just when it's comfortable, not just when it's convenient, Lord. Not just when it's hard. God, we don't want to be dependent on you just when we feel like Man, the heat's turned up in my life and I need to lean into Jesus so that this trial can get behind me. No, we need to 
to lean into you all the time. So Lord, we confess that you are the only one worthy of all of our praise, worship, honor, and glory. And it's certainly not ourselves. God, we want to be those that answer the call that Jesus gave to his first disciples when he said, look, if you want to follow me, you got to die to yourself. You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and come after me. That's who we want to be, Lord. We want to be yours in Christ's name. Amen.